Welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. I am honored and delighted to have Brian Kempel here. Uh, he's a student of, uh, of John Dealey. I think he's the only person who's got a PhD under John Dealey. And uh, semiotics is new for all of us over here. So I'm looking forward to exploring what semiotics is and what it can do for us. So welcome, Brian. Well, thank you very much for having me. Glad to see everyone here. I think we'll be able to have a hopefully hopefully an intelligible and fruitful discussion about semiotics and what it is. Uh, it's it's a rather difficult subject, so uh, I hope I'm up to the task. Wonderful. So can you tell a little bit before we begin? Can you tell a little bit about uh, yourself and your interest in uh, in philosophy uh, and how did you come to focus on semiotics? Yeah, um, so I, I got my PhD in, in 2016 at the University of St. Thomas in Houston, Texas, uh, where yeah, I was the only one to ever complete a dissertation under John Dealey, which I'm not sure if it says that says more about me or about uh, John Dealey and his personality, <laughs> uh, probably the latter. Um, but yeah, you know, I got into philosophy uh, from a fairly young age. I, I started just reading it, you know, books around the house when I was 14, 15 years old always had an interest in it. And it just sort of uh, you know, one small decision after another uh, led me to, to St. Thomas and led me to study with John Dealey. And you couldn't have a conversation with John Dealey without semiotics coming up somehow. Uh, so as, as soon as we had some sort of relationship uh, between us intellectually, it just, it, it, was, it was inevitable, I guess you could say, that I would, I would move this direction. Wonderful, so what is semiotics? Yeah, um, <clears throat> the easiest, and I think for that reason, perhaps best definition is simply to define it as the action or the study of the action of signs, uh, that we're trying to figure out how signs really operate in our world, uh, not just for us, but especially for us, perhaps, uh, but throughout everything, uh, that there's, there's a kind of universality to how signs are influential. And so studying the actions of signs is, is um, something which in a way, um, I mean, you know, you said that it's, it's new to all of you here. And I think in a lot of ways, it's new to everyone, right? Uh, the, the word itself goes back uh, actually to John Locke, who proposes it in the very last chapter of his essay concerning human understanding as one of the great branches of study. And yet no one really takes this up for, for several hundred years until Charles Sanders Peirce. And so it's very much a new idea. Uh, Peirce was, was lived from 1839 to 1914 and was a marginal figure at best in, in the world that he, uh, uh, the academic world of his time. He was, he was ostracized for, for many reasons, uh, not the least of which were, were his um, uh, romantic inclinations, let's say, uh, regarding uh, his mistress. Uh, but regardless of all that, um, you know, his, his work was sort of kept in a basement at Harvard for a long time. No one really had access to it aside from a few published articles. And when they finally did get access, it was fairly limited. So his thought was, was uh, sort of kept, you know, away from the mainstream for a long time. So it's, it's very new. It's very new to, to everyone. Um, but in a way, it's also one of the oldest things, uh, semiotics, the study of signs, we can find roots all the way back in, in Aristotle and in Plato and the way they talk about the meanings of words and, and you know, the periharmonious of, uh, on interpretation of Aristotle. Uh, we can find it in St. Augustine. We can find it in all these great thinkers of antiquity. And so it's something that has extremely deep roots, even if it hasn't become an explicit study until recently. How did Burr's approach semiotics? What is his approach? Um, chaotic in a, in a word. Uh, um, Peirce is really, he is the founding father of semiotics as a discipline. Um, he had a, a, an enduring interest in logic from his earliest days. And logic and semiotics are very closely related. We might even say that semiotics is a genuinely postmodern development of logic. And I'll explain what I mean by genuinely postmodern when it comes to talking about John Daly's Four Ages of Understanding. Um, but the, the approach of, of Peirce is, is, in a word, it's very holistic. 
uh, that Peirce saw everything as essentially connected and that this was really what grounded uh, his, his approach to, to trying to understand signs and how they, they are everywhere. Uh, he's, he's somewhat famous for saying that the uh, entire universe is perfused with signs, if not constituted exclusively of them. The first part I agree with, the second part I think is a little bit silly, uh, but the, the universality of signs that they're everywhere, that we're always uh, interacting with them, trying to deal with them, this is this was Peirce's great contribution, um, as well as his very detailed attempts at studying signs and how they operate, uh, how they can be classified or, or understood in relation one to another. Maybe I can ask a question about the relationship between semiotics and linguistic because people mm -hmm. are fam familiar with what linguistics is. So how is semiotics related to linguistics and distinguished from it? Yeah, one of the ways that that question comes up very frequently is that there's an alternative school often called semiotics, which stems uh, from a European tradition, uh, Ferdinand de Saussure, who was also late 19th, early 20th century, uh, was uh, taught, I can't recall where he taught now off the top of my head, uh, but his, some of his students puts together some of his course notes into a book called A General Course in Linguistics. Um, and it was a fairly popular book for some time in which Saussure proposed actually the name semiology as a study for the action of linguistic signs. And so uh, in a way that's a more appropriate name, semiology, having, having the logos as part of the etymology of that word, the, this notion of, of the rational account uh, of antiquity. Um, but this actually gets developed into a point where, where one finds uh, thinkers like Jacques Derrida uh, appropriating Saussure's thought, but calling it semiotics. Um, and so uh, there's, there's lots of other thinkers in that school. Uh, Roman Jacobson is one frequently named, uh, Yuri Lotman. Uh, the, the Russian Tartu uh, school of semiotics is deeply grounded in that tradition. Um, so while they focus more on, on linguistics, uh, the Persian tradition, the Persian approach to semiotics, looks at linguistics as, as a part of the whole. Right? That linguistics are, are meaningless if we don't understand uh, the structure of any language in terms of signs. But to understand all signs in terms of linguistics is to reduce the whole to a part. Uh, so uh, yeah, actually, there's a, an article by John Dealey called The Pars Pro Toto Fallacy. Uh, something about a confusion of, of semiotics and semiology. Yeah. Wonderful. So what happens to semiotics after Peirce? Well, you know, for, for a while, it sort of disappears into a, a dark hole. Mm -hmm. uh, aside from, from uh, a few names, a few people who sort of uh, recognized a little bit his genius in his own time, um, Josiah Royce being one of them, William James uh, being another, uh, his, his work was not really appreciated for, for quite some time, um, but uh, eventually it, it gets rediscovered in the 1950s or 1960s, I believe, by a couple of students at Harvard who are basically just looking for a project to do, looking for something to do with their time and their opportunity, and they stumbled across some of his papers in the basement at Harvard mm -hmm. and ended up putting together uh, the, the collected papers of Charles Sanders Peirce, which is a rather large extremely expensive eight volume uh, collection, which is sort of chaotically edited. They tried to edit these things thematically and it's, it's very all over the place. So it's a very difficult thing. Uh, but this really caught the attention of Thomas Sibiak. who's uh, one of the names that you'll find if you search semiotics on the web. And Tom Sibiak really did a lot to, to try and bring Peirce's brilliance to, to general public consciousness. While he didn't get very far with the general public, he did get some attention in academia, including the attention of John Dealey. Um, <clears throat> and so he, he helped found various associations internationally and nationally for semiotics, uh, helped to, to get started the American Journal of Semiotics. And uh, this has sort of been a slowly growing movement uh, over the past I'd say 60 years that the attention has really started to, to come to, to Peirce and to the depths of his work, um, to the point that they're, they're now working on a, a complete chronological edition of Peirce's works. Uh, these, these, these white volumes uh, sitting right back here behind me 
Uh, I, I have six of the seven which have currently been published out of, I believe, 30 or 35 that they have planned. Wow. Um, so there's a lot still coming. There's a lot that we still don't have great access to in the work and the thought of Charles Burse. And uh, I, I'm just I've got my Google News alert uh, for for, you know, the next time that they actually publish something. Uh, I'm waiting with bated breath. Wonderful. <laughs> so now let's move to John Dealey. So who was John Dealey and can you tell a little bit about his work? Yeah, uh, John Dealey was, was my dissertation director. Um, he was a philosopher, a semiotician, a prolific author. Uh, I believe he authored 20, somewhere in the mid 20s in the number of books, uh, 25, 26 books, uh, co-authored or edited another 36 and published somewhere in the range of 250 to 350 articles during his life. Um, and his, his magnum opus about which we'll talk a little bit today is the, the Four Ages of Understanding, which is, as, as you can all see, is, is quite a heavy tone. Um, sort of, you know, uh, retelling the history of philosophy from the semiotic perspective. Uh, but to give a little detail of his life, um, John actually studied with the Dominicans, the, the Order of Preachers, uh, for a number of years at the, the River Forest Institution. Uh, where he eventually discerned that the priesthood was, was not the way that he was going to go with his life. And so ended up, uh, you know, after finishing his studies there, uh, writing his, his master's and his doctorate, actually on the thought of Martin Heidegger, um, then went to go work uh, uh, for, for Mortimer Adler at his Institute for, for Philosophical Research, uh, where he spent, uh, I believe, a few years um, before moving on to, to Loris College, where he taught for, for many years, and then eventually to the University of St. Thomas in Houston, where uh, I had the fortune, fortunate uh, ability to meet and get to know him fairly well, uh, before he, he went to St. Vincent's College in Latrobe, Pennsylvania, shortly before he, he passed on in 2017. Um, where there is now actually a, a John Dealey uh, wing of their library, as he donated his personal uh, library uh, to the school there, uh, his personal library of some 14,000 volumes. Um, so it's, it's a nice collection. Uh, uh, in fact, it's, it's such a large collection that he had a Dewey cad card catalog system in his house because he needed it to find his books. Uh, so he was, he was a great thinker. He was a, a very big personality, um, had lots of uh, terrible jokes and puns that he, he loves to try and get any sort of reaction from, uh, and, and just a, a really great friend and advocate to me. So uh, he, is, he is missed dearly. Wonderful. So let's talk about his work on semiotics and then come to this uh, book whenever you're ready. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, so uh, I think one way actually of approaching this a little bit is, is uh, sort of seeing both in John's own movement and in his contributions, the importance of history. Uh, that, that John really started to move in this direction, not from immediately coming to the work of Charles Peirce or semioticians, but actually from his interest in John of St. Thomas, or John Ponceau, as he might also be known now, who was a 17th century Iberian scholastic. Uh, he was born in Portugal, taught most of his life in Spain, but was also somewhat cosmopolitan and had spent some time in, in Belgium and around Europe and, and uh, had, had a diverse background um, in his own family life as well. And John of St. Thomas, uh, who's uh, over my other shoulder here, are these three red volumes is the Cursus Philosophicus. Uh, it's this massive tome of you know, the, the course of philosophy uh, that, that should be taught in universities as he saw it within which there's an awful lot of discussion about signs, an awful lot of discussion about how signs work and what they are, uh, why they're important, which uh, John Ponceau had taken up from his own teachers, uh, the semi-anonymous uh, Conumbertenses, who uh, were a group of, of Jesuits at the University of Coimbra in Portugal. And so it's in reading uh, John of St. Thomas, Dealey saw this, this importance of the sign in the thought of, of John of St. Thomas and, and in the history of philosophy, uh, which led him into these semiotic associations and, and to sort of develop um, his, his own thinking along those lines, to the point that John actually uh, edited out certain portions of the Cursus Philosophicus and translated it into yet another thick volume uh, here, the Tractatus de Signus, 
uh, which was originally published in 1985 and reissued in a second edition in 2013 uh, from St. Augustine's Press, the second edition. Um, and it's a wonderfully you know, uh, nuanced, careful, difficult text wherein the nature of the sign is, is examined and thought about in terms of its, its full impact and its full import and to, to really see how signs function, most especially in, in human life, but also in, in other animal lives as well. So in, in a way, that's part of uh, John's, I suppose, first contribution to semiotics is the recovery of its history. Uh, in fact, his first book published in the field of semiotics is, is called Introducing Semiotic, Its History and Doctrine. Mm -hmm. It's a short little volume published in 1982. Uh, in which he, he details this scholastic background, which is actually incredibly illuminating for understanding semiotics as it was uh, brought to light in the 20th century. In fact, what you might, might take away from studying uh, John Daly's work and studying Peirce in comparison is that you can't really understand Charles Peirce unless you understand scholasticism. Mm -hmm. That the scholastic background, Peirce himself was an ardent scholar of the scholastics. He was deeply influenced by John Duns Scotus, by Thomas von Erfurt. Uh, he read the Conan Bricenses, he read Thomas Aquinas. All of these thinkers were very influential in Peirce. And yet, if you don't know those thinkers, you're not going to recognize it. So that's a major thing that Dealey was able to bring to, to semiotics in its 20th century fluorescence. Uh, additionally, there's a number of other things for which he's, he's known and which he can be considered as, as a great contributor uh, to, to an understanding of semiotics. Um, just to name them very briefly, we don't need to go into any details. But he really helped to highlight the importance of the, the reality of relations and how relations are integral to our, our study of signs. Uh, he helped expand the notion of causality as it is typically conceived to, to include certain categories beyond the standard Aristotelian four of uh, agent or efficient, formal, material, and final. Um, he also proposed doctrines of, of physiosemiosis, that is to see how the entire universe is structured in a way which is at the very least towards the action of signs. And um, the last two things there that I would mention are, are first, he shows a continuity of nature and culture as affected by signs. And finally, he shows the value of semiotics for interdisciplinary studies, that the, being as universal as it is, it allows us to see how, you know, what, what ethics and, and chemistry have to do with each other in ways that other disciplines don't. Wow. Okay. All right. Now this this is a very tall order to cover, you know, how semiotics does all of this. But I think this book is a good place to start because many mm -hmm. of us are familiar with the Western corpus. And maybe if we can show how semiotics illuminates this and provides a deeper understanding of it, and then we will go into few of these themes. Uh, so please tell us about the book. Yeah, um, so the four ages of understanding, the easiest way to get into it is to consider just what are these four ages. Uh, so very simply, the first age is the age of, of Grecian antiquity, the age in which philosophy was carried out principally in, in the language of the Greeks. And so uh, beginning with the pre-Socratics and their attempts to understand the universe and understand most especially the physical causes of the universe. Mm -hmm. In a way, this, this sets the tone for a lot of Grecian philosophy. Even in Plato, as famed as he is for his you know, dwelling in the clouds and dwelling amongst ideas, Plato is nevertheless very much concerned with explaining what we see and explaining that really what we need to understand in order to understand what we see are these ideas, but he's still in a way trying to give an account for this natural world in which we live. And we see this exemplified even more strongly in Aristotle. Aristotle, this you know, master of those who know, who, who studied everything that there was to study at the time of his, his life, who's very much concerned with explaining the physics. If you want a work to understand Aristotle's thinking, you look to the physics more than you do to his metaphysics. And so the, the ancient Grecian world, as much as they relied upon notions of myth and the gods, 
were, were very imminent in uh, a profound way. And so we can look at them in terms of a, a semiotic study in terms of studying the signs of nature, that that is what their focus was towards, was towards how certain things are revealed through, through natural signs. Then the change to the second age, the age of, of Latin philosophy. And just as a little aside here, uh, from the four ages of understanding, Dealey extracted a second book, uh, which is, is now actually available in its second edition, finally. Uh, this is Medieval Philosophy Redefined, which is now titled Medieval Philosophy Redefined as the Latin Age, mm -hmm. uh, in which he argues that we really shouldn't have, have called it uh, the medieval ages, really. It's, it's the Latin Age, the Latin, as Latin becomes the language of philosophy. And so this Latinity or this age of Latinity um, really begins with St. Augustine. Uh, St. Augustine, who understood Greek and read it probably better than he let on or would have other people understand, but really was focused on, on the Latin language and doing his own philosophy in the Latin language. And Augustine makes a huge contribution to semiotics in that in, in uh, book two of his On Christian Teaching, he says that there's a difference between natural signs and given signs, signa naturalia and signa data. And this is something that was somewhat tacitly acknowledged or recognized by the Greeks, but was never really named explicitly and was no basis for any doctrine in their own thinking. And so Augustine, by doing this in a way, kicks off a, a whole different way of viewing the world, of, of the world of nature and the world of culture, both constituted in some way by signs and both approached by us through signs. And so uh, there's certainly a period of, of you know, uh, intellectual diminution between Augustine and the high Middle Ages, as we tend to call them. Uh, but there's a lot of other interesting thinkers who have minor contributions along the way, particularly to the study of the arts and the structure of education. But it's not really until you start getting into these debates over words and names that starts in the late 11th and 12th centuries with the first rise of nominalism. Uh, so you'll hear names like uh, Jean Rosselin and John of Salisbury um, and Peter Abelard. And you'll hear all these discussions and these arguments that they had about, you know, what, what do names really signify? What do words really signify? Um, <clears throat> and you find some of this is taken up a little bit by, by Thomas Aquinas. Um, Aquinas, uh, I, I think he's more uh, informative on this issue than has yet been recognized. But as it was never really the focus of many of his questions or articles, it's you have to sort of read between the lines in, in a great number of texts to see everything that he has to say, which is relevant. Uh, but certainly his his own psychology, his approach to the internal faculties of sense and the intellect and the will is definitely reliant upon a notion of, of signs and the use of signs that is entailed therein. Um, <clears throat> So this Latin age develops through these great thinkers and reaches its culmination in John Ponceau in the 17th century. Skipping ahead a bit here for the sake of time. Mm -hmm. um, and Ponceau's uh, uh, contribution is, is enormous and really should have been recognized much more than it was. But of course, given the political fragmentation of Christendom, which was, was occurring and, and ongoing by the mid 17th century, and the relative isolation of the Iberian Peninsula intellectually from the rest of the European world, his thought was really only preserved in monasteries and universities of the Iberian Peninsula. Uh, it, was, it was not spread much beyond that really until the 20th century uh, when there, there was a, the ongoing recovery of Thomistic thinking. Um, <clears throat> So that brings us really to, to the third age, the age sure. and, of- And what we will do is it mm -hmm. looks like from whatever little I have read, that mm -hmm. understanding of the Latin age is the critical point that John Dealey has. So we will come back to it. Let's go through all the four, mm -hmm. then we will come back to this. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, and certainly when we talk about post-modernity, I think we definitely, we have to go back to the Latin age and, mm -hmm. and recover some understanding of it. 
But how we got to the point where we lost the understanding of it in the first place is an mm -hmm. interesting tale in its own right. Um, and, I, uh, you know, John Ponceau and Rene Descartes of, of fame or infamy, depending upon uh, your philosophical perspective, were contemporaries. Uh, John Ponceau was writing in the 1630s and 1640s, uh, the, the same time that Rene Descartes wrote his Discourse on Method in 1637 and Meditations on First Philosophy in 1641. Um, but of course, Descartes' way of ideas, as I believe Leibniz was actually the, way, the one to coin it, becomes the dominant way of thinking in modern philosophy, in really all modern philosophy up until Charles Peirce. And what's meant by this, this phrase, the way of ideas, in contrast to what Dealey calls the way of signs, is that rather than understanding our own thinking and our own thinking processes as essentially semiotic, as essentially constituted by signs, the Cartesian term, the Cartesian inversion, we might even say, is one in which we just sort of start to presume without really questioning it, it seems, that our ideas are the direct and immediate objects of our knowledge that we know the things in our own minds and only by a second later act of comparison are those ideas what leads us to thinking of things outside of our minds. And it's fascinating that you find this is adopted by rationalists and empiricists alike. They both take this as a presupposition. No one seems to question it. And this dominates the philosophical landscape for hundreds of years. Wow. Trickles down to everything. <laughs> um, <clears throat> So this is uh, what we find, uh, you know, Dealey explains through the, a number of, of thinkers, uh, especially Locke, but a bit of, of Hume and Kant as well, how they give their own systems based upon this fundamental error, this fundamental mistake in, in understanding our own understanding. Um, as, as Aristotle puts it, or as, rather as Thomas Aquinas paraphrases Aristotle on it, a small mistake in the beginning becomes great in the end. And, simple as a mistake as it might seem that Descartes makes, it very quickly, I think, becomes an enormous error for, for all the Western world and its intellectual culture. Um, Let, so, let's spend, let's spend a couple ahead. of minutes on this because this is, I think, the critical point. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to talk about the distinction between ways of way of ideas and way of science. It looks like, I mean, again, I don't, I don't know this, so I'm just going to blurt out. Please correct me. Please elaborate on, elaborate. So how is ways of science different from ways of ideas? It looks like ways of science is a loop where you're trying to actually look at the world. You're producing that this is what the sign is. Then you're acting on it and you're actually, it's part of a living process rather than this kind of world of ideas, which is kind of separated out and then somehow maps back in some way. Um, how, how do you see it? What, what is ways of science? Yeah. Um, so actually, let me, let me start very quickly. Is I, I always tend to start with the idea that I disagree with as a way of foil, uh, setting sure. up a foil for what I agree with. Um, yeah, the way of ideas, um, you're right, there is a, a separation. It, it introduces immediately this chasm between the mind and the world. And all of modern philosophy, I think, can be read as an attempt to bridge that chasm with each attempt, rather than getting across it, actually widening the chasm further to the point with Immanuel Kant, the world in itself is entirely unknowable to us, right? Um, so we, we actually just throw the, the world away, the chasm turns into an, an eternal abyss of unknowability. Whereas with the way of signs, um, and this is really grounded, uh, again, in that scholastic Latin age understanding of what a sign is. Uh, the way of signs looks at our, our thoughts or ideas or concepts or whatever we'd like to name them as being what they called formal signs. And this is in opposition to what they called instrumental signs. So as an example, an instrumental sign would be anything that we can look at first as an object in itself and then secondly, interpret its semiotic significance or its semiotic action, we might say. So uh, a stop sign, very simple example, the sort of the, 
the easiest example, we probably all know what a stop sign is. Uh, we all know what we're supposed to do when we see a stop sign. But you have to see a stop sign first to know that you have to stop there. If you can't see it, the relation of the sign doesn't occur to you. Whereas with a formal sign, like our concepts, we don't have to stop and look at our concepts in order to see the things that they make known to us, in order to grasp that they're present to us somehow. And we see a little bit of this recaptured just as a quick divergence in the phenomenological idea of intentionality as they sort of reprise that notion, which is again, a scholastic Latin uh, notion. If you're familiar with Edmund Husserl at all or anyone's familiar with Husserl and his thought, you know, that's sort of the cornerstone on which he bases his philosophy. Well, it's, it's pilfered from the scholastics and in a way which actually screws it up a little bit, but it's the same idea, right? That all of our consciousness, all of our thinking is always of or about something other. It's always directed towards the other. Well, that's the same thing with a formal sign. A formal sign is, is almost like a lens that you don't look at itself, but which focuses your vision, which focuses your attention on this rather than that. So the way of signs is, is all about you know, this, this real connection, this real relation that we have to things as intelligible rather than ideas as intelligible that we have to somehow connect up with things. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, and so in a way, I think that brings us fairly nicely to, to the fourth age of philosophy. And this is the age which um, really does begin with Charles Peirce, or perhaps more accurately be to say that it begins with the recovery of Charles Peirce, because he was almost lost to history. Uh, he was almost lost to the, to the world of ideas, to, to the Western canon uh, philosophy, when he really ought to occupy a pretty prominent place in it when all is said and done. And so this, this fourth age, Dealey calls it uh, post-modernity. And now that's a term which might be associated with certain movements in art and certain thinkers like Jacques Derrida or, or uh, Roland Barthes or um, you know, Giles and Deleuze and some of these other types of thinkers um, whom Dealey would actually name ultra-moderns, mm -hmm. uh, taking up that term, um, modifying it a bit from Jacques Maritain's hyper-modernity. <laughs> Um, which is to say that they've really just taken this fundamental chasm presupposed by modern thinkers between the, the world and the mind and run with it to its sort of uh, extreme conclusions. In fact, I think the way of, of understanding a thinker like Jacques Derrida is that there's nothing but relations for, for Jacques Derrida. It's just all the relations that we're, we're constituting and, and reconstituting for ourselves and trying to make sense of things. So uh, that ultra-modernity is in contrast to a true post-modernity, a, a philosophical way of thinking, which gets beyond those fundamental errors of modern philosophy, which gets beyond that fundamental presupposition that our ideas are the direct and immediate objects of our, our understanding. And so this begins with, with Peirce. We can say that maybe some contribution is made to it from, from Husserl, certainly I think from Heidegger, and I think other thinkers like Tom Sibiak and John Dealey will be recognized for their contributions and their pioneering in this endeavor as well as time goes on. But essentially, it does consist in this recovery of the Latin age's understanding not only of signs, but also of their metaphysics and their physics and their, their understanding of, of human psychology. Um, all of these things contribute to a, a revitalized understanding of the sign. And, um, you know, not ignoring or discarding everything that was in modernity. Certainly a lot of the turn to the subject, which figures in, in modern philosophy has a place and can be absorbed into this post-modernity. Um, in, in, in a way where the challenges brought by modernity do provide a, a genuine heuristic to move forward in a postmodern thinking. Uh, but certainly we, we have to recover that scholastic understanding, I think, in order to, to truly move beyond the errors which were fundamental to modern philosophy. Okay, so then let's try to, you know, let, let's try to talk about the Latin age and the understanding of science there and to see you know what is it that we are recovering and how is it different from the modern age 
Right. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, I mean, in a way, um, I think what we find in scholastic philosophy, as opposed to, to let's say, early modernity, um, <clears throat> Is, for one thing, it's much more systematic. It's much more uh, richly and robustly developed as a whole system of philosophy. Descartes was mostly about eliminating things. If, if you really look at what Descartes has successfully achieved, it was to, to not uh, look at all of these, these you know, various considerations that the scholastics had put forward. And Descartes, of course, was himself educated by scholastics. He was educated by the Jesuits at La Flesh. Um, who themselves were, were probably deeply influenced by uh, Francisco Suarez, who was the, the main figure of the 16th and early 17th centuries. Um, and so uh, it, it's, not, um, it's not as cut and dried as all things scholastic are good, all things modern bad. Uh, certainly there are many problems in scholasticism, certainly there are many difficulties, but they really had an understanding, I think, unlike what you find in a lot of modernity, with the exceptions perhaps of Leibniz and Kant, um, that you have to explain everything if you're going to explain anything. Uh, that if you're going to explain how we understand things, well, then you need, you, you, you know, better be sure you have a solid metaphysical theory behind it, an understanding of, of being and act and potency, uh, causality, how all of these things um, contribute to the whole chain of being. Um, you better understand the notion of a soul and what a soul is and what a living thing is as opposed to a non-living thing. You better be really um, well-schooled in your logic and understand the notions of second intentions as opposed to first intentions. Um, so all of that's in the background of what's going on in, in the Latin age of philosophy. And it, there's a reason why, you know, John Ponceau's Cursus Philosophicus is, is 2,600 pages long, right? It's because he's dealing with all of this. He's dealing with all of these questions and trying to say, okay, how can we understand all of these things together and understand all of them coherently? Uh, it's also probably as a, as a side note and a little um, tip of the hat to, to Marx, uh, one of his favorite characters, Marshall McLuhan, we can't underestimate the importance of the printing press at this point in time either. It's a lot easier to pass around pamphlets of Descartes' meditations than it is to carry around the Cursus Philosophicus with you. And I think that has no small <laughs> impact on uh, which of the two becomes more influential. Uh, but uh, uh, to, to go back to the, the philosophical points, um, <clears throat> you know, the, the uh, psychology of scholastic thinkers is incredibly richly developed. And it's very much based upon an observation of how we interact with the world. Not in any way an attempt to impose a framework, uh, which is I think quite contrary to what one finds with Descartes or even Locke, where there's, there's certain sort of faculties which are posited or abilities which are posited, and then trying to sort of fit the experience to, to match that up and to get rid of whatever doesn't fit with the the, the system or the attempted imposition. Um, whereas the, the scholastics are, it, it starts with sensation. It starts with, okay, here's these real things outside of me, really acting upon me, having a real relation up, uh, to me in some way, uh, such that I'm really related to them. They're really affecting me. Uh, how are we going to understand that? How are we going to understand that process? What's going on in sensation and what's going on after sensation such that I can start to develop these ideas and, and, and have the thoughts that I have. And I know in a previous uh, uh, meetup, you had uh, Mark Barker uh, give, give a talk. Uh, and he's, he's certainly the one to talk to about the, the cogitative faculty and all of its, its various nuances and, and complexities. Um, but that's something that, that you don't really find much discussion of in modern philosophy uh, until you come to Kant of this interaction between something like an internal sensorium and an intellect. Mm -hmm. And how is it that these two things can, can operate and how can they do so in a way which explains our interaction with the world? And so I think that uh, it's, it's not as though there's a simple like, okay, here's where, you know, the one answer where scholasticism, uh, you know, fixes everything, right? Uh, one really does have to study a lot of it to see how see how it does have these applications and how it does have this this uh, utility for a semiotic perspective. Let me try to summarize it. What I summarize what I understand and tell me whether that captures at least some of it. 
the distinction that I see with the scholastics, with people like Aquinas, uh, that's the person I'm most familiar with, is that you're focused on life as such. You're focused on actually the process of how you take in stuff, how you, you know, what happens to your faculties in terms of imagination, in terms of, um, you know, kind of processing it, seeing patterns in it. How do you store that within your brain and that entire, and how, how does that shape your evaluations, your actions? And you are aware of this living process within which you can understand what is what ideas are or what signs are. Instead of saying, my theory is that this is the sign, this is what ideas are, kind of almost like a blank slate and just positing something out of nothing. It, it, they're kind of, they're rooted. It seems to be like more of like Aristotelian approach mm -hmm. to life with tremendous amount of sympathy and starting from life and consciousness of living process, processes as a starting point, um, as a foundation, as the ground for looking at what science or ideas are. Does that, is, is that a fair distinction? Yeah, um, I mean, I, I would point to perhaps one way of looking at it, uh, not that this is, is true of every thinker within scholasticism or the Latin age generally, but as a whole, there's a humility there that one does not find in modernity. There's a humility that says, these are the things to learn from, the, the world outside of me. It's not what's going on in my mind or my head or anything like that, but there's, there's a reality more fundamental than my own consciousness, and my consciousness is informed by my interaction with that reality. Um, in a way which does contribute to this, this holistic, continuous understanding of things. Um, and, and again, to, to point to Charles Peirce as someone who was steeped in scholasticism, one of Peirce's main theories that he propounded is what he called cynicism. And I can maybe type that out later just because <laughs> there's a lot of ways that that could be uh, misspelled in someone's mind. Uh, but his theory of cynicism was that of fundamental continuity of the universe, that there are no gaps in being is the way that he looked at it. And I think that that's the way the scholastics looked at it as well. Uh, there might be grades of being, but they, they abut, you know, right up against one another. The human beings come right up to the angels in, in Aquinas's you know, system, his theory. Granted, there's, there's a big difference between them, but it's not as though there's a gap. There's nothing which goes between angels and human beings. And so uh, this, this continuity, this fundamental continuity, um, is, is starkly opposed to that uh, immediate presupposition which divides the world from the mind, which underlies all modern philosophy. And in fact, I think you can see all modern philosophy continues down that road of, of dividing, of, of instituting gaps and separations. There's the mind and the world and nature and culture and, and uh, the will and the, the true. Um, I, I think that you, you find these increasing separations go along. Um, <clears throat> Wonderful. Uh, what I was thinking of doing is to take some of the other themes of John Dilly to see mm -hmm. how it works, how the same point is applied there. You talked about the continuity between nature mm -hmm. and culture. Could you, and, uh, could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, in, in, a, in a single sentence, and I'll expound on this, but we've tended to, to sort of take this view I guess I'm not starting with a single sentence, but I'll get there. Uh, we've tended to take this view that the culture is really its own separate thing, which has no essential connection to nature. Uh, but once we understand how culture itself is actually constituted, which is to say through various kinds of signs, that without signs, there would be no culture whatsoever and signs of a very deliberate human constitution once we recognize that that semiotic constitution of culture is a part of our own nature, then we can see this fundamental continuity of how nature gives rise to culture. Now, that doesn't mean that all things which occur within culture are coherent with that nature because of our, our nature, our nature as these semiotic animals, as Dealey uh, came to, to define the human person. 
trying to displace the definition of the human person as the rational animal, the, the old Porphyrian definition. Uh, this notion of the semiotic animal is one that, uh, because of that, has, has free will, because of that semiotic capacity, has the ability to constitute falsehoods deliberately and to share and spread those falsehoods deliberately, or not deliberately, as it may be. Um, <clears throat> So that doesn't mean that everything in culture is, is coherent with our nature or with nature in general, but it can be. It can develop in a way which is continuous and, and coherent and constructive and complementary. Um, and we, we see lots of initiatives in that direction with you know, um, ecological care and concern in recent years, at least an attempt, uh, perhaps some misguided and foolhardy like Oh, say drilling in Greenland uh, for for electric car batteries, I think. Uh, but we see the attempts nonetheless, right? That there's an attempt to 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 have nature and culture continuous with nature as the foundation. Mm -hmm. um, and I think what we see a lot of times otherwise is it goes the other way. Once once we have that sort of fundamental divide, we try to impose culture on nature instead of to to have our culture fit our nature. But uh, that's that's a rant for another day, perhaps. Wonderful, um, but we'll take, uh, I want to take two more aspects and then we'll look at the general uh, question again. You talked about uh, John Dealey focusing on reality of relations. Mm -hmm. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, um, in a way this might be the fundamental issue of all philosophical struggle that's happened in the Western world since time immemorial, I think. That, uh, especially today though, I think it's especially strong today um, there is a presupposition in the minds of almost everyone that what's really real are individuals, that individual things are alone what constitutes reality, that relations as something which exists independently of our own minds aren't real, that they don't actually exist independently of our own minds, or essentially the same thing for us as human beings, they can't be known if they do. And this is in a way, um, I mentioned earlier the, the theories of nominalism. In a way, this is, uh, you know, nominalism is a term which gets thrown around a lot to cover a lot of different theories. This is the essential uh, tenet of all nominalistic theories that relations independent of the mind don't exist or can't be known. And what this does essentially is it, it, it cuts off the possibility of signs because signs, and this is a point that uh, we'll perhaps return to uh, here in a moment as maybe a way of, of leading into the Q&A. Signs are not things. Signs themselves are relations because what is it to signify? Well, it's to accomplish this intermediation between the object and that to whom the object is signified. Well, if that intermediation isn't actual, if that relation isn't accomplished, then no signification has occurred. And so the sign can't be the thing which seems to cause that intermediation because the, it doesn't always, right? Uh, someone who's never seen a stop sign before, who has no knowledge of stop sign, isn't going to have the law signified to his or her mind by the sight of the stop sign. Uh, <clears throat> So uh, understanding just what relations are and that they're real, that they can be real, has an enormous impact for semiotics. It's, it's really, uh, in a way, a, a kind of bedrock issue. And this is, again, this is something that Dealey takes up from John Ponceau, as it was a frequent topic of debate in the 16th century um, and, and going back 16th century, 17th century, um, both of them were, were very much concerned with this issue of what, what are relations? Are they really real? Are there relations that we can know that are real? Um, and it's, it's a question on which just an enormous amount hinges, I think. Wonderful. Um, I, I'm going to ask, um, actually, let me ask, I was planning to ask you about uh, the application of this to interdisciplinary thought. So if you could uh, just touch up on that, but I have a bigger question. Go ahead. Yeah, um, uh, I, my, my thoughts on, on how exactly to present this are, are still somewhat scattered. I'm supposed to give a talk later this year 
uh, uh, sort of demonstrating some of these things. So I've got, I've got too many ideas and, and not the right words, I think, for explaining it at the moment. But in short, uh, one thing where I, I see a very clear application of this would be in the field of psychology. Um, you look, for instance, at, at the 2015 replication crisis, which hit many of the sciences, but most especially psychology, in which you had a, an enormous number of studies that had been popularly spread and distributed and, and accepted and got a lot of attention, which couldn't be replicated or were not replicated with the same levels of confidence or, or as strong of findings as they were originally uh, reported upon. And I, I think that one of the huge issues which is at stake there is that there is a great misinterpretation of the signs that were being reported upon or the structure of the experiments and how they would present these objects. So I think understanding the nuances, the subtle nuances of signs and how signs operate can help us to structure and, and perform much better experiments in a lot of these sciences. Um, to, to really see, you know, what is it that we're signifying and how are we signifying it so that these misinterpretations don't get such credence so quickly. Wonderful. Um, the last question I had, and then we'll try to wrap up everything and then we'll open it up to question, was we've studied works of people like uh, James Havelock, Walter Rong, uh, people like that. Um, and they make a very clear distinction between like Walter Rong makes a distinction between orality and literacy. So all these four ages are you know, start with literacy. So how do science operate before literacy in an oral culture? I'm sorry, I missed the last part uh, of it. How, how do science operate in the oral culture before literacy? Because these four ages start with literacy. <laughs> Yeah, um, I mean, it's an interesting question that I'd have to say I, I haven't um, considered it too terribly much. I know that there's probably a good amount of work done on this, particularly by those in the more semiological tradition um, who've, who've looked at the uh, evolution and development of, of language across various forms. Um, but I will say that there is a, a certain continuity in sign structures um, regardless of the particular media in which they occur. Not to say that the media make no difference for the, the um, influence and nature of sign relations, uh, but there's, there's a more fundamental structure which is studied by semiotics, I think, such that what you're, you're looking at in, in orality as opposed to literacy or televisual or digital forms of communication, there's going to be some continuity in the sign structures. Um, Certainly, it'll it'll change, uh, and and the the nature of the sign vehicle itself, that is to say, that which intermediates between the object and the uh, let's call it the date of uh, the interpreter, uh, for for lack of uh, a more nuanced discussion, um, the the vehicle does have a, a significant influence, and I think that that's something that actually figures like Marshall McLuhan and, and Walter Ong seized upon. Um, I think it was, I think Chris Morrissey uh, title, wrote an article in which he titled uh, Marshall McLuhan, The Accidental Semiotician. Well, I don't agree with Chris Morrissey on a good number of things. I do agree with him on that. Uh, he was accidentally studying the, the influence of, of sign vehicles uh, on, on our understanding of things. I'll, I'll make one last attempt to talk about, to kind of um, explicate what difference that I see between the modernity on one hand and the postmodern and the Latin age on the other. The postmodern or Latin age is kind of takes reality as given or nature as given, has a humility towards that and is developing ideas based on that. And that always seems to use that as a base. Whereas the modern seems to privilege the abstract almost before reality and then somehow says, okay, now I have to make some connection between what I have in my head with reality now and struggles and struggles and fails most of the time. Um, do you think that's a fair uh, way of characterizing it or how, how would you put it? Well, if you had to summarize the difference, uh, what would yeah, you? Um, I mean, I, I think that's a, that's a pretty good summary. And uh, though I would distinguish that 
Whereas the, the Latin age did take reality and, and the, the extra mental, as we might call it, as a given, postmodernity has not been afforded but that luxury by the challenges which have been made through modernity, which is not to say that it, I think it has to struggle a great deal to, to get back to uh, a belief in the accessibility of the cognition or mind independent real. But it is something that it does take up and it does defend, um, that, that we do have this access, we have this, this intelligibility, which we can get to and really grasp and really understand. Excellent. Um, let's go ahead and let's go into some Q&As. Uh, folks, uh, we've got four rules, as always. Type an exclamation mark in chat or raise your hand in Zoom in order to ask a question. Rule number two, keep on topic. We're talking about semiotics. Rule number three, be brief. Rule number four, feel free to speak your mind, disagree with anybody on anything and do so courteously. First up is going to be, it's going to be Mark, Charlie and Phil. Mark, go ahead. Uh, Brian, this, is, this has really been uh, wonderful. Um, I, I was uh, uh, really thrilled that, that you uh, agreed uh, to join us. And it's, uh, uh, I think long overdue. Um, uh, this will wind up uh, as a YouTube uh, uh, post to be able to use it uh, in, in, in your business. And, and uh, I think others uh, will all benefit from that. My question for you is, uh, it has struck me for a long time, and you and I have talked about this, that it was a loss of understanding of forms, um, which uh, are so important uh, in um, Latin uh, thinking. And uh, my initial reading in, in Dealey, which got me all excited and ultimately led to meeting you, was, was his um, very elaborate efforts to uh, begin to draw distinctions between extrinsic, intrinsic forms and so forth. So it, 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 some, it, it strikes me that the loss of an understanding of forms uh, lies uh, at the root of uh, these difficulties you're talking about. And... Uh, so the question that I have for you is the use of the term or the sign um, information. And uh, obviously this is, this is the term form with a prefix and a, and a suffix. Um, you used informed multiple times and, and you're talking about the stuff, but this process of information, information science and, and, uh, and so forth, um, uh, is that going to need to be um, examined and uh, maybe discarded for us to make breakthroughs uh, in this area? Um, are we going to have to get over this this whole uh, hang up on information and and in order to return to science? Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll go ahead and say, uh, for, I, I believe you know of his work, but uh, for others who don't, someone has tried to bring information theory and semiotics together. Uh, Soren Briere, you know, who has a, a subfield or discipline, which he's, he's been pushing along with others called cyber semiotics, trying really to take partly from, from cybernetics, but deals more with information theory in his actual work. Uh, so there, there is an effort, and I do think that there is some complementarity there. However, I think an Aristotelian understanding of forms does need to be reinstilled if ever there is to be hope for information theory to be elevated, we might say, to the way that it can function as, as semiotics would have it function, mm -hmm. uh, or that it might function along with semiotics, perhaps would be the way to say it, um, which is to say that, that information theory uh, does seem to fall into a sort of hyper or ultra modern understanding of what forms are, which is abstract, not really real in things, but a sort of abstracted digitality, we might even say, where, where they are pulled away from the analog or the, the material real or the concrete real. Um, and so I think that, uh, yeah, really understanding the Aristotelian notion of, of forms, not as what is abstract essentially, but which can be understood in an abstract manner apart from their actual existence would be of, of great benefit to people who are actually trying to make sense of things in information theory. Um, 
Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Uh, next up is going to be Charlie, Phil, and Mike. Charlie. Uh, yeah, I uh, typed some questions in the, uh, in the chat, but uh, I, I'm interested. Uh, there are some people uh, in, uh, in modern times, uh, George Lakoff and Mark Johnson wrote a book, Philosophy in the Flesh, where they developed this idea of metaphor as being the basis for cognition. And also Ian McGilchrist uh, has, has uh, been studying this, uh, the, the uh, lateralization of function of the brain where uh, the right side of the brain is doing a lot of this stuff that you're, that, that when you were talking about how the sign is, is, is functions within the brain that it's, it sounds like you're, you're uh, talking the language of, of Ian McGilchrist. And I, I was wondering if, if, uh, if you're familiar with uh, either of those um, uh, people and, and do they in, uh, inform your understanding of semiotics in any manner? Uh, the short answer is familiar with, do they inform my understanding of semiotics now? Um, now, I mean, Lakoff and, and Johnson, I've read a bit of here and there. Um, it didn't uh, strike me as something that I, I was, that was the best use of my time, my limited time to pursue, which isn't to say that I've discarded it, but it's moved to the back of the shelf. Uh, Ian McGilchrist has moved closer and closer to the front of my shelf uh, as more and more people that I respect and and whose uh, uh, understanding I esteem have lauded his work. Um, in particular, um, um, I, I believe uh, Mark actually knows his, his work as well. And then uh, there's a few other people that I've, I've worked with, um, people in brain science uh, who've, who've spoken highly of what he's been doing, as well as um, uh, Scott Randall Payne. If ever you want to look up someone who's been working in semiotics, Who's, who's taken up Ian McGilchrist. I know um, um, he's, uh, Father, Father Payne has done some work on this area as well. Um, I have looked at various studies within neuroscience and, and cognitive science and their attempts to look at the, the functioning of the brain in regards to these issues. Um, and I do think that there's uh, a lot of room for, again, uh, where semiotics can help us to understand these things and in, you know, parallel, they can help us to, to understand uh, some of the, the physical structures which go along with these essentially relational actions of semiosis and sign use, um, which is to say that there's, there is a complementarity there, I believe. So thank you for that. Wonderful. Thanks. Uh, next up is Phil. Phil, what's your question? Yeah. Uh, th thank you, Brian, because uh, your presentation had explained a lot of things and cleared up a lot of things to me. The most fundamental being the relationship between uh, knowledge and life. So, so that's that's important. Also, has cleared up the uh, semiotics between Susur and you know and, and Purse, which is good, which is also adds to it. So, I see uh, Purse and John Daly as uh, performing the most important task of an archaeologist, which is to dig for the past, to understand the past, in order to pass down the information so we have a better understanding of where we stand now in order to proceed into the future. So that's a very, very helpful. But the question I have then is, why is his excavation extends only back to Greece when maybe it should have been extended at least as far back as maybe the cavemen because they had signs uh, at, certainly, at, but even if not excluding that, uh, why not back to the Egyptians or the Babylonians? And uh, you know, and then I also wonder whether this is entirely a a, a Western Occidental project because it's excluded or sidelined. Have not talked about Chinese and other languages that may have added information to this excavation even if they were an older form of it. So could you explain why it's so restricted to essentially Western uh, developments, especially since it excludes the pre-Western that cer certainly inform uh, the Greeks? Could you say mm -hmm. something about that? Yeah, I mean, I think the simplest, easiest, and most honest answer is that uh, Truth is a coy mistress, and we don't have world enough in time 
to unearth it in, in all of its various forms in which it has appeared. Now, to, to be clear on that point, Dealey has strongly encouraged people to search into these things themselves. Uh, he, he very much, um, um, you know, was supportive, uh, for instance, of a translation of his basics of semiotics into Chinese, uh, as well as into to Russian and into any language that it could be translated into, uh, because he wanted to encourage people within their own particular cultures and their own histories to, to explore into those roots. Um, but I think to, to really have the depth of knowledge to adequately explain and understand these things takes more time than most of us have on earth to do in, in all of these different fields. Um, so being steeped in the Aristotelian scholastic tradition as Dealey was from the age of you know, 18 onwards, that was where he, he felt confident enough in his own knowledge to, to give these excavations. Um, and really, I mean, the four ages of understanding is, is aimed at a, a Western audience and at people working within the Western tradition of philosophy, not, I think, in an exclusionary sense, but in a, an awareness of, of one's own tradition and one's own uh, situation historically, culturally, geographically. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'd certainly think uh, looking into the Egyptian influence, for instance, would be uh, fascinating. Uh, you know, to see how they influenced the Greeks and the Greeks thinking. Um, I have a good friend from from Cairo who's who, who read the Four Ages of Understanding, and he's he's like, what, you know, the, first of all, it's wonderful, but also there's all these things that I know that I, I'm curious why they aren't in there. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's really just a, a matter of, of of world enough and time, and and having too too little of either. Um, I mean, John Dealey lived, you know, uh, uh, 74 uh, years on this on this earth. He, he actually died something like two weeks older than Charles Peirce died. Um, and he wrote a, a great, great deal, uh, but he was still taken uh, far too soon. So wonderful. So, folks, we're going to take one more question and then we're going to do breakout rooms for just 15 minutes so we can brainstorm amongst us, uh, amongst ourselves and then come back with more questions. Uh, so the last question is from uh, Mike. Mike, what's your question? Okay, uh, it's, I, I'm definitely impressed with what you said. Uh, and uh, also, also what Mar Mark and, Ch and uh, Charlie have said, among others. Um, and, uh, there's, a di uh, there's a dialogue that, um, uh, that uh, John Dealey got uh, got quoted uh, in uh, his Eternal Braid and Strange Loop uh, papers, um, and he's the Gertel Escher Bach guy, and uh, about uh, how um, what you're doing and what semiotics is doing in extending the concept of information theory into areas like. Uh, atomic physics, like DNA encoding, that well, although they said they mapped the human genome, they really didn't map it. They just came up with a, uh, uh, a general structure. And the true meaning of all of that language uh, is not there and uh, taking it into cryptography. Have those, uh, have some of your work or things that uh, uh, that you've talked about. I'm not familiar with Father Payne or McGillcrest, but uh, I am from, I've seen uh, uh, Dealey's work. And I just wonder if I, uh, I only vaguely can tie this together. And I, maybe I can be in the same breakout room with you to, to take it one step further. But uh, can, you, uh, can you tie some of these loose ends together maybe in uh, the quizzical mind of everybody, especially me, or maybe not especially me, but everybody else who's, uh, who's looking intensely at what you're doing. Thank you. Yeah, um, I mean, really it, it is, in a way it's overwhelming to consider the extent and, and fecundity which can come out of semiotics and looking at you know, things like DNA, as you say, or, or really just biology in general. In fact, there's a whole subdivision of semiotics, biosemiotics, which might be the most popular uh, field in which it is employed, which is constantly looking at just sort of uh, all sorts of, of fascinating things. I mean, it's, it's, 
I'm not a biologist by any stretch of the imagination in my training. And so a lot of it I find is, is outside my realm of, of expertise or comfort. Uh, but it is really fascinating to look at the ways in which, say, viruses, for instance, uh, can be understood in a, in a semiotic manner in their own use and interpretation of signs and, and how they develop. Um, I think it would be of a, a great utility at the moment, for instance, in the pandemic age, uh, to, to take a semiotic lens to the, say, uh, you know, variation and replication and uh, mutation of, of the current coronavirus. Um, so I do think that there's a, an enormous um, extent to which this will, will be a way of understanding very diverse phenomena, uh, technological, biological, uh, astrophysical, uh, anything that you can name, there's a way of bringing a greater clarity to it from semiotics, provided we can get the clarity about semiotics in the first place. <clears throat> Wonderful. Um, so folks, we're going to do the breakout rooms just for 15 minutes to brainstorm questions. And then we come back and we get to ask one last, you know, you, you can ask your best question. All right, starting the breakout rooms now. Welcome back, folks. Welcome back. All right. So this is the final opportunity to ask questions. Um, what's the best question you have on semiotics? Go ahead and type exclamation mark if you'd like to ask questions or raise your hand in Zoom. Okay, it's going to be Mark followed by Elena. Mark. Thank you. Um, uh, I asked a question to Brian in the breakout and, and he asked me uh, to uh, bring it here. Um, so I'll rephrase this. Um, Brian described uh, an answer to a, a question uh, from Charlie, how um, Aristotle's four causes were expanded to uh, seven and how Dealey uh, and others have um, accounted for this. And uh, my question is uh, uh, recalling uh, Brian's statement in the original session that we, we have to recover our understanding of causality and in particular uh, formal causality. Uh, I'm very much in agreement with that as, as Brian knows. So my question is what has to happen to us? What might cause us to recover our understanding of causality? Um, which I'm uh, agreeing is uh, really, uh, the, the, that's the um, that's the trap door that we've got to find our way through uh, to get out of of uh, so much of the situation we're in, and, and we could elaborate on what the effects of that would wind up being. But what has to happen to us, and what might cause a recovery of our understanding of causality? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a great question. And I can't say that I have any, you know, foolproof answers, certainly. Uh, but what I think and what I think will, I hope, will happen is that, um, let me preface this by saying something that I, I found myself repeating a lot lately, as we constantly have similar such discussions at, at the Lyceum, um, that belief is a habit. Belief is not something that we, and this is, this is to paraphrase Charles Peirce, belief is not something that happens as a matter of a single moment of conviction where you flip a switch intellectually and say, okay, well, now I believe that. That belief really does consist in a continued pattern of seeing a proposition as true and acting in accordance with it. Now, that being said, I, I think the belief which has to shift is that we can't think that we know everything in order for us to really under, reclaim an understanding of causality, that the information isn't simply out there. Uh, this is something that you find all the time with people today, especially young people, um, that they, they don't think they really have to learn how to ask questions anymore, that all they need to do is pull out their smartphone and type something in and find the result on Wikipedia to answer all of their questions. Uh, so I think anything that we can do, anything that we can foster, which uh, produces this attitude of questioning, of genuinely asking questions, is going to help us to recover this understanding of causality, to see that it's not simply a linear progression of event after event, which is recorded in the archives of Wikipedia, 
but that there's real debate and discussion to be had about these things, which is that we really have to ask, okay, well, what are they? What do we mean by asking, what are they? How do they come about? What are the causes of them? Because a, a mere, you know, efficient causality link of, of chronological events doesn't really answer those questions. And I do think that, that in some ways, digital media does allow us to do this in a way that wasn't possible before. I mean, mentioned the fact that we have this community that is participating in an event like this on, on taking up their Sunday evening with uh, discussing ideas and, and posing questions and challenges. This is an indication, I think, of how we can do this, of, of what sorts of things will foster that recovery of causality. It's not foolproof, it's not guaranteed, but it's a possibility, uh, so. Wonderful, yeah. thank you. Thank you, Brian. Next up is going to be Shane Murray, Charlie, and Mike. Shane Murray. Yes, hi, I, I apologize. Much of this is beyond me, but it made me think of the divine in particular. So presuming that the divine exists, what, us allow, what allows us to be receptive to the relational signs from the divine, um, as I imagine, the divine exists, that that would be the language in which we would communicate. Yeah, um, you know, I'm actually going to appeal here much more to, to Thomas Aquinas uh, on, on this particular question, um, that primarily whatever receptivity we have to any understanding of things divine, supernatural, is communicated analogically to us, right? So which is to say the, the sign has some sameness in itself with the object and some difference, uh, some, some incalculable, inestimable difference, but a difference from that, that divinity, which allows that sign to, to or that sign allows us to, to understand nonetheless somehow. And very interestingly, and this is a little bit of an aside and I won't say too much about it, um, but when talking about the relations of signs, and I, I mentioned this a couple of times in the course of the main conversation, um, there's always three elements involved in any sign relation. There's, there's the sign vehicle, there's the object, and then there's the recipient of this, this sign relation. Um, and this, this triadicity uh, has uh, immense implications for Trinitarian theology. Um, which is, is really quite fascinating to me. Uh, in fact, when you go and you read what Aquinas says about the, the Trinity and the divine persons, it's all relations and how relations are communicated. And there's, there's a lot of uh, simpatico uh, uh, lining up of things in that regard. Um, so I do think, I mean, there has been some work done on this a little bit. Um, uh, Father uh, uh, Payne being one who's actually got a, a, a new book coming out on uh, sort of relates semiotics and, and uh, angelology, um, which is very interesting. Um, and so, yeah, there's, there's some people working on this, uh, not many yet though, in the realm of theology or, or uh, studies of the divine. Uh, so it's, it's fertile ground for the future, I think. <laughs> Thank you. Next up is uh, Charlie. Charlie, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I had to unmute myself. Uh, I want to continue a little bit on the on the question that was started by Mark. Uh, uh, one of the things, uh, interestingly, Dealey did his PhD dissertation on Martin Heidegger, who spoke about presencing, of being present. And uh, in a lot of Asian philosophy, uh, and related to the person who brought up that question about uh, you know uh, using Asian culture as as a uh, uh, resource for understanding uh, semiotics. Uh, that in Asian philosophy, you have, uh, you have Buddhism and Taoism uh, that also encourage this like mindfulness practice where, where, where you, you try to be present with where you are at. And uh, in, in that, that mindset, so to speak, could, could I would think, would, would potentiate learning of semiotics quite a bit. Uh, anyway, does that make sense to you? Oh, yeah. And in fact, I actually, um, I, I wrote a book on, on Heidegger and Peirce and, and phenomenology and semiotics and their complementarity with one another, in which uh, Heidegger's you know, notion of, of, of presencing and how things are made present to us uh, figures quite prominently. Um, I, there's, there's remarkable parallels, I think, between the, the two thinkers um, <clears throat> uh, in all sorts of ways. Um, but yeah, I, I do think that this, uh, you know, being aware of the structures through which things are communicated to us and by which we ourselves communicate to other things, communicate with other things and especially with other persons, 
uh, does help to, to bring a greater awareness of their reality into our consciousness. Um, in fact, uh, Peirce has some very interesting things to write about consciousness as well, uh, in, in line with his general metaphysics and his semiotics, again, in the sort of triadic structure of a, an immediate consciousness and a polar consciousness and a synthetic consciousness, uh, in which uh, the, the notion of how things are present to us uh, along these sorts of various, uh, almost artificially divided strata, um, to the point where, where there's a presence of the general and the universal and a presence of the particular and a presence of the self, which all needs to be understood to understand the presence of anything as, as properly human. Um, so yeah, I think there is, uh, you know, again, there's, there is a, probably a lot of fertile ground for, for complementarity with uh, various tenets of thought in Eastern philosophy as well. Thank you. Uh, now it's going to be Mike followed by Phil. Mike. Uh, the, uh, I'm interested in the discussion uh, that uh, apparently went on in the break room of uh, causality and four causes expanded to seven. Uh, in the quantum world, um, they've been attempting to, uh, to come up with a hidden variable strategy uh, that discusses that uh, the a causality and the weirdness of quantum mechanics and the uncertainty it doesn't really violate causality, but it's just we don't know how it works. And what what are the other three causes of causality that you can, that you uh, presented? Yeah. Um, so this is uh, an, a, again, this is something which uh, develops into late in late scholasticism. Um, that as they contemplate Aristotle and contemplate these these questions of uh, um, you know causality and how to understand them that more needs to be said, right? Not to say that they they think um, there isn't an essential relation of these to the Aristotelian four, uh, but they are thinking really about, you know, uh, forms and, and change, and how forms and change are related and need to be understood. And so, whereas Aristotle has this internal formal cause alone that he talks about, at least explicitly and in a way which is transmitted through the tradition. There might be some implicit hints here and there in other parts of his work. Uh, but they, they realize that we really need to think about forms which are external to the thing which is affected by them and remain external to them. So they advance two different kinds of external formal causality. The first, an exemplar or ideal causality, uh, such as would be present in the mind of God or the divine ideas as, as remaining in the divine mind and yet really causing things to uh, fit that paradigm, um, or the mind of an architect or an engineer or anyone who's planning something, uh, an artist of any kind who has an idea in their mind which directs their action into the thing which receives it uh, while remaining in, in that mind. Uh, and then there's also what they call objective or specifying causality, which is um, <clears throat> rather complicated to explain succinctly. So I will point, as I did in the breakout room, to John Dealey's 1994 book, New Beginnings, or my 2019 book, which you can find on Amazon, uh, Introduction to Philosophical Principles, um, for, for more uh, robust explanations. But essentially, in, in the briefest terms that I can give for it, uh, the form of the thing itself determines the relations to the sign vehicle and to the interpreter uh, while remaining in the thing itself. Uh, that there's a way in which that, that causes this chain of uh, semiosis to unfold. Um, so that there's a way in which it's, it's external, but it really causes a change internally in a way which is the same, but also different <laughs> to, to, to give the... Uh, short, difficult explanation. And then very quickly, they also have a notion of external final causality, um, which to give the simple example of would be that uh, a soldier individually might have his own reason for fighting in a war, which is different than the reason that his battalion has for being in a specific location at a specific point in time. Uh, both really cause him to be there in some way, cause him to be acting for the sake of something, but they, they are different from each other. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, we'll take one last question from Phil, and then I want to ask Brian about uh, what he's doing with the Lyceum Institute. Uh, Phil, go ahead. Yeah, uh, 
I, I think your answer to causality has helped me in terms of understanding science a little bit better, because it seems to me the way you expressed it, science are all over the place. And, and I had previously thought, okay, and I still think that actually, the signs or something that you have to have a, some degree of intellect or understanding to understand the sign, to motivate the sign. But if there is an, also an external form, or external cause, then that kind of explain it, that the signs operate within self. Because I am thinking that, for instance, I especially have the problem with just inert materials right? Like, like planets. They seem to follow a path, right? It is hard for me to think that they have an understanding that to stay on track, <laughs> like don't move away from it. So it seems to me the process itself guides it. But if there, if, if there is a degree of understanding, and certainly a degree also of the ability to want to push against that, then you have, in a sense, you have your track of creating your own destiny and relationship to this external track that's happening that could cause things to change. It doesn't necessarily change because even as Heidegger says, that changes your destiny and seeking the clearing, but the being doesn't necessarily expose itself in the clearing that you created. It just exposes itself in a, in a clearing. So therefore, there is a joint effort between the destiny of, of the, uh, of the, how should I say, the internal cause of the of the track in the self, in this case, gravity, or what we think is gravity, and in in the sense of what you can able to transform it. So that I understand the sign better because the way you explain it almost seems like, oh, there might be lower lower level of things that understand the signs. But it's hard for me to say that, well, they understand and that's why they stay on the path that they are. So well, could you explain, am I at least getting the beginning of that understanding or am I way I, off track again? No, I, I believe so. And in fact, this was a, a, a quote of Jacques Maritain's that Dealey uh, favored and used quite frequently that all animals at the very least, and we could even say plants and, and perhaps even in some way material bodies, make use of signs, but only human beings know that they make use of signs. And that this is a distinctive uh, category uh, it, or results in us belonging to a distinctive category, such to the point that we talk about semiosis as the use of signs and being semiotic, which is studying signs or understanding that we use signs. Um, and so, yeah, this is, um, uh, you know, it's it, 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 that universal perfusion of signs, that signs perfuse all things, um, certainly in our own understanding of them. Uh, anything that we understand, we understand on the basis of, of some sign which relates or intermediates us to that object, but also that other things make use of signs. Uh, it's it's hard to see exactly how that happens exactly with immaterial, or with material bodies, but Dealey actually proposed a theory for it. It's what he calls physiosemiosis. Uh, it's one of his contributions to semiotics. Uh, there's some fascinating articles on it that he wrote, um, that there's a kind of nascent use of signs even in, in non-living things, uh, that they are structured in such a way so as to, to react to their environment in a way which seems at least towards semiosis. Um, so I think you're definitely on the right track there, it, it seems. Thank you. So. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, last question from Mark. Mark, go ahead. Uh, yeah, it's, it's just a note here. Um, the Dealey book, uh, Amazon wants more than $100 for whatever copies are available. And and Brian's uh, book's available for eleven seventy five. dollars I just bought a copy. <laughs> I recommend that everybody else here uh, do that. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. So, Brian, what are you doing with uh, Lyceum Institute? Yeah, so uh, I started the Lyceum Institute in 2019 as a way of uh, getting outside the rigors of, of uh, bureaucratically run academia, uh, which is to say that uh, there's, there's 
Well, I'm not going to go into all the issues with academia that I have, uh, but a way of, of trying to, to bring people who really just wants to study philosophy, who wants to study language, um, to, to bring them together online, to give a community where there's academics and interested people from all walks of life who can take seminars together, who can study semiotics, study phenomenology, study Thomas Aquinas, um, study Aristotle, study the Latin language, uh, which I think is immensely useful for our own intellectual uh, fecundity, um, <clears throat> and looking to add other languages as we go. You know, so it's a persistent online platform, uses Microsoft's Teams. It's on you know 24-7, got about 70 members from all around the world. Uh, people are, are making use of it just about every day, which is, is great, I think. Um, so yeah, it's, it's been a wonderful experience so far. We've got about, uh, uh, probably 120, 130 hours of lectures that are available to all members and it's, it's going great. Wonderful. Wonderful. Brian, thank you so much. This is a, this was a difficult task of <laughs> introducing sem semiotics. And I think we made a good, good start. I think, I think this was a good, uh, kind of beginning introduction and thank you everybody for just wonderful questions. I was really astonished of how much people knew about this or knew around this topic. So, so thank, thank you very much. Really, really appreciate that. All right, folks, have a nice evening. Thanks. Uh, uh, feel free to, to get my email if anyone wants it and, and send me any questions if you have any follow-ups. So Absolutely. thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye, Bye everybody. Bye.